Well, thanks everyone and thank you guys for being here today. Um, why don't we start with you, Courtney, and with a little overview of the Amgen versus Sandoz case and what's at stake? Sure. So the Amgen versus Sandoz case arose um, surrounding the first biosimilar to be approved by the FDA. And it raises two issues for the Supreme Court to decide. The first is whether the patent dispute resolution procedures of the biosimilar statute are optional. That is, whether the biosimilar applicant has to share its application with the originator and go through the steps of what we call the patent dance in order to um, figure out the first round of patent litigation, or whether the biosimilar applicant can decide not to participate in that process, keep its application confidential, and leave it to the originator to um, detect or find out about the biosimilar application and decide on its own which patents might be infringed. On the second issue relates to the pre-marketing notice requirement, and that's a requirement that the biosimilar applicant give uh, 180 days notice to the originator before they begin marketing their biosimilar. And the question on that issue is whether that notice can be given before the biosimilar is approved or cannot be given until the approval is obtained. So, and they both kind of hinge on, on sort of seemingly minute but actually pretty important issues, right? So one is, isn't the word shall really important in, in this? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it? <laughs> it, it's very interesting um, on, on both issues, um, shall comes up um, and the Federal Circuit decided that shall does not really mean shall in the first issue, but shall does mean shall in, in the second issue. Um, so on, on the first issue, the statute does say that the biosimilar applicant shall uh, share their application with, with the originator. But the statute also imposes consequences for not sharing the application. And the, that's where the court found some leeway in shall not being mandatory. Oh, makes perfect sense. Um, <laughs> and then what, why is it important whether the, the six month window, why is that an important window? Um, so that's a really important uh, window to all parties and to the public because that determines when uh, consumers and patients can actually start receiving the biosimilar drugs. As it stands now, the, the, with the, you have to wait for approval to give the notice and then wait that six months before marketing. So that essentially you know, keeps the drug off the market for six more months after the FDA has approved it. Okay, well, why don't we get a take from the stakeholders here? What is your respective takes on the patent dance? Advantages, disadvantages? <laughs> well, one thing I, I, I will say, first of all, I think on the patent dance, I think the expectation of those who drafted and who, who participated in the you know, long public debate, and unlike uh, many elements of the Affordable Care Act, this is probably the, probably the most fully vetted aspect uh, and enjoyed bipartisan support over a long period of time. And so I think the, and, and it really involves the, the trade-off between what are the right set of incentives for the innovator. And remember, before there's a biosimilar, there has to be a biologic. And so the Congress acted in certain ways, in the, for example, the 12 years of data protection to uh, foster the next generation of innovative products. Uh, and so I think the expectation of all those who participated is, you, with respect to the patent dance, you've got to face the music. I mean, that, this came with it. And, and so, yes, I think there are some uh, interpretations that the, that the Federal Circuit made um, uh, that um, you know, I, I, I suspect uh, is, is news to those who are most involved in, in, the, in the debate. And even though uh, Justice Scalia is no longer with us and he takes a dim view of, he took a dim view of legislative history, I think that um, you know, I'm just, it's sort of surprising to, to anyone involved that this is even a, this is an issue. Uh, so, uh, on that aspect, I, I think you know, shall shall meant shall, and I you know I don't I, I, we we wait for these contemporaneous statements during the debates that this was a just a discretionary uh, uh, you know system. I, we just you know I just think uh, it's it's a great surprise. And remember, um, 
what we really want to accomplish, we believe, is to make sure that the, both of the sectors are adequately, uh, uh, the, the rights are preserved. And so for the innovator, um, it seems to me that the Congress certainly didn't want to have the innovator put in a position where all of a sudden there's these surprise attacks on patents. It's supposed to be an orderly system. There'd be notice. Um, we could discuss these issues uh, you know, way before um, the, uh, the, the patents expired, and, and that seemed to be you know, part and parcel of the system. And Phil, what's your take? Um, so Momento is a biosimilar company. I think for the biosimilar business choice is a good thing. Um, I wasn't there for the bipartisan debate on, on, on whether or not this pathway is optional. Um, I think if the pathway um, was required, there wouldn't be the remedies that were acknowledged by the court. And so, you know, there is music to be faced, whether that be uh, a patent litigation or a DJ action brought by the other side. Um, I think, you know, when we say patent expirations here, that there's, there's, we need to separate those patents that protect um, new cures um, from those that are designed to, I guess, delay patient access to biosimilars. Um, there are certain patents out there for certain molecules that I think we would all agree don't um, protect new cures, but are rather designed to delay patient access through abuse of litigation and various other um, strategies. So I think with respect to optionality, it's case by case and choice is a good thing. What about, tell us what it already takes for a biosimilar to come to market. What, what do you have to do to get, get through the FDA, get through everything, all the uh, red tape? Is that for me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> To be determined. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think choice is a good thing, and, and you know the, the road is long, and, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, as of right now, what we've seen is people doing fairly um, expansive clinical studies. Um, Momenta has a slightly different position to that, and we'll, we'll wait and see how that plays out. But what's the, what's the argument for making it an easier path for biosimilars? What is the argument for making it an easier path? Yeah. I think you know, patient access is key here. Um, I think the safety is, is, is critical. We certainly agree with that. Um, I'm not sure easiness is what we're looking for here, um, but certainly clarity would be important. Okay. If, if I could just jump in there. Yeah. I think, uh, as I understand the balance, it's similar to Hatch-Waxman, I think, uh, you know, even though the data uh, that we're talking about is, was trade secret, it was protected for an infinite amount of time until this Biosimilars Act came into existence, similarly to the way when the Hatch-Waxman law came to existence for small molecules. And I think the societal trade-off is, what's a fair period of return for the innovator before we hand it off to the, uh, the less expensive generic or biosimilar copies? That's really, I think, the global question. So I think the, the, the trade-off is, you know, how do we get the sufficient incentives on the innovator side, and we can then allow uh, these other products to come on the market, so, which are more uh, cost of, uh, available to, to, to patients. So I think that's the, the basic uh, uh, public policy balancing. And I, uh, one point I just I want to make about the, the patent dance in this particular piece of legislation, because of the way it unfolded, it, it really didn't get these provisions that has Justice Breyer and others really scratching their heads, what, what do they mean? It never um, got the full um, pro normal process of Congress. There were, you know, what, what happened was in 2007, in the Senate Health Committee, this bipartisan bill was marked up. Um, in the next Congress, uh, uh, it, it was taken up. And uh, this is during the time that, uh, you know, it's an interesting set of events where Senator Kennedy gets sick. This is actually the last major bill he worked on with Senator Hatch. He voted in favor of this bill. There was a parallel set of legislation occurring in the House uh, with, with Congresswoman Eshoo uh, and, and, uh, and, and Mr. Uh, Joe Barton and Mr. Inslee. Um, and what, it, because of Senator Kennedy's uh, you know, untimely death, uh, what was passed was the, actually the 2007 version in many respects. And so we never really had um, the, the House, um, I think the, the House sponsor said, well, hey, let's stick with what the Senate did. Let's, let's, that's a bipartisan bill. We never had this conference. And only because of the unique circumstance of the, uh, the, the, the way the reconciliation rules, the sort of the Congress had to sort of take this language or leave it. And so I think in a more normal system, I think this language would have been refined so you, don't, you wouldn't have Justice Breyer you know, sort of almost you know, pleading, well, can the FDA get us out of this? Can the FDA fill in some of these gaps? I think, um, the, I think the normal ping-ponging in a complex IP law 
uh, just d didn't take place. And I think uh, on this particular issue, um, and, and, and as I, we're probably going to go through many others, where the, where the, you know, the courts are going to struggle with language that probably could have used some more refinement. Well, Bruce, can you help us understand, I mean, just from, from your perspective, I think a lot of times when pharmaceutical companies say they need longer patent protections, that's difficult for everyday people to understand. Why is that important to pharmaceutical companies? Well, at first, I don't, I don't think we want longer patent protection. The, 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 our Congress and the rest of the world got together in the GATT Treaty to say that patents should be at least 20 years. And it turns out that in our domestic law, under the hatch wax, which applies both to drugs and biologics, the cap is really 14 years. And so for some of the most important products uh, in, in the economy, it's, you know, we're, we're, you know, we don't get the 14, we don't get the 20 year because of the development time for our products, which can go 10 to 15 years, can cost $2.6 billion. We are actually um, you know, treated not as well as, we, we're, not, we're not as treated as well as the cop killer bullets that put people into emergency rooms. And if you want to take our products to help cure you, we actually have less patent protection. So we think uh, what we need is that a, a fair amount of an independable patent term. So I don't think it's longer um, than, than, than what is expected elsewhere in the economy. We talk about a unitary patent system, patents. Uh, we don't pick and choose winners and, and, and losers in terms of length of patents. So, um, you know, we would like to see a system where we're assured of the, uh, of the of a reasonable amount of time, which I think in our system since 1984, you know, this 14-year this period is something that's uh, once again agreed to in a bipartisan fashion. And what do you think of the, the American exclusivity period versus the one in, in Europe? I mean, the, so it's important to know when that exclusivity period runs from, right? It runs from when the company chooses to file its application. So I think, you know, historically when, bio, when biologics haven't had any competition, patents were filed earlier, maybe out of universities. I think that can be addressed by prosecution strategies within organizations now that we know what's ahead of us. Um, I know that you know the 12 years of regulatory exclusivity was was intensely debated by partisan I assume and, and it could have been more it could have been less but that's what we that's where we landed um, coincides coincidentally I think with the expiration of most of the um, patents that that cover the um, the new cures the composition matter the new indications so to me you know it, it seems right um, mm -hmm. but aren't they usually shorter in Europe though the patent periods no 20 years Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I just, I just want to yeah. make one, one yeah. comment on the patent strategy since that is, that's, that's my bread and butter. Um, there, there, there is limited ability to delay filing your patent application to provide its life uh, to, or to coordinate its life with the approved product because we're in a first-to-file system. So if you, the longer you wait to file your patent application, uh, the more likely it is that, that you won't be able to obtain it at all. Um, and especially when we have research done um, in public agencies and universities where the professors have to publish, you have to file your patent application before any publications can be made. So it's actually quite difficult to hold on to your technology and file your application later. I did want to ask about, are there any safety issues that do come up with biosimilars? And anyone and everyone can weigh in. <laughs> Well, the one thing I will say, I think there's some in, in, uh, that have sort of argued that you know, the sky is falling and the, the, these products can't be made safely. And I think when you look at the quality of the, of the firms that are entering this market, I think we, we, you know, we're going to have reasonable certainty, certainty of safety of these products. Uh, you know, you know, Sandoz is, a, you know, is a, you know, obviously a, a first-class manufacturing entity. You know, I start my day with two generic drugs every, every morning, and I think... Um, I think generally speaking, we, I think we can rely on, on, the, on, the manu, on the manufacturers and we can, the most important, I think rely on the FDA oversight. But having said all that, I think it's also the case that reverse engineering producing a small molecule drug is, is different uh, than uh, producing a, a, a biologic. And from time to time, there will be issues. There's this famous uh, incident with, with Johnson & Johnson with the, uh, one of their cleaning agents for some of their corkers, uh, corks rather, um, contaminated a, a, a batch of their biologics. Uh, so from time to time, there will be safety issues, but we would hope and expect, like with, like with generic drugs, that it can, patients can take a, a, a biosimilar with absolutely you know, the same type of certainty that you get um, from, you know, you would expect from, from any medical product regulated by the FDA. You want to weigh in on that? I mean, I, I haven't personally seen any data on adverse events for a biosimilar that's different for that of the, of the brand biologic. 
I think it's an important issue, but I haven't seen any data yet. I think one thing that's interesting about this field, because of the complexity of the technology, we have companies on both sides of the equation. So Amgen is the originator in the Amgen v. Sandoz case, but they are also um, developing biosimilars of other people's products. Mm. So I think that speaks to the complexity of the technology, that there's not, it's, it's harder for companies to have the, the know-how and the facilities to generate them. But it also makes these issues very interesting because you have the same companies on, on both sides of all the issues. If I could just quickly jump in. I didn't hear all of Congressman Welsh's uh, much as com uh, comments guys in the, in the hallway, but to the extent, I think one area, I think we, there, there is concern about is imported drug products, both drugs and biologics, I think raises a, a different set of questions. I think just uh, yesterday, the day before, I think former uh, FBI director, I think at, uh, uh, issued a report, I think which I think believe that pharma uh, uh, subsidized the report, but he found, you know, he's a man of great integrity, but he also noted that um, there's increased risk of safety and it, it, it could put a drain on law enforcement. There, there, there's issues there when you start importing drugs that maybe the FDA can't you know, regulate all drugs at the same level of rigor of, from overseas. So, I, But I don't think that's um, uh, specific to um, biosimilars. I think that's, um, you know, I think we have significant concerns. I think the public should have significant concerns about imported, the safety of imported drug products. Well, I want to get to audience Q&A in a, in a couple minutes, but first, is this an effective way to bring down drug prices? Are biosimilars sort of one way? I mean, we have this, this uh, you know, spiraling prescription drug costs in the U.S. Um, I think the FDA commissioner has signaled that generics might be one way to c contain that, you know, is, is this an effective strategy? Anyone, anyone? <laughs> My answer is yes, I hope so. Um, yeah. as, a, as I said, as a person that takes um, um, generic medicines, but I, I think that the GAO does this running tally of, 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 of savings, and I think, I believe it's from 2004 to 2015, it's a running 10-year total, that uh, off-patent off medicines, generic versions, have saved consumers $1.1 trillion, $1.1 trillion with a T dollars. And so I think when the biosimilar uh, system comes uh, uh, fully up and running with more, more products, I think uh, uh, we're going to see the savings achieved to the system. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing. And I think from our standpoint is we want to be sure that we have a fair period of time on the front end for innovative pro products to be rewarded for our efforts. Um, and, and so, we, so yes, we think that um, it should produce some savings. Do you have a take on that? I agree. I, I think you know, it, it, it should produce some savings. I also think that I'm hopeful that it will drive innovation, drive new drugs. Um, How would it do that? Competition causes people to run harder. Uh, <laughs> so I think as, as biosimilars come on the market, I think we will see brand organizations look to develop new products to essentially maintain their, their, their revenue streams. Okay, great. Um, do we have any audience questions? Question? They're coming around with mics. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Susan Campbell with Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease. And I wonder if you would comment on um, the scenario that um, Congressman Welsh talked about with the Milan executive um, explaining how the high prices that they charge really aren't the high prices that they charge because of the whole chain from designing and producing the drug to getting it in a pill box. There's a lot of um, costs along the way. And for some reason, that we, we just don't seem to be able to get a handle through the lack of transparency on where those charges actually accrue. And I'm wondering if anyone could talk about that. Let's make a comment. I know that next week, I think, in the Senate Health Committee, there's going to be a hearing on exactly that topic. And I think one of the issues um, are, you know, how much of the, uh, how much the middlemen in the system uh, uh, consume. And so one of, I think, the great public policy debates now is um, the types of discounts and rebates that innovator companies pay in order to get onto formularies. And, uh, and so what, what, role the, what role the PBMs have and what role the insurance companies have that with insurance designs that make uh, people pay more out of pocket, um, you know, front, first dollar costs and deductibles. And I think one of the things that we've done as a company, and I think other companies are, are also starting to do, is how do we figure out how to pass off 
that discount directly to the consumer. So we work with the PBM we, through Blink Health, and I want to name our products, but I think you can go uh, into a uh, directly and get the same type of you know, 30 to 40 percent discount that we make with the insurance company. That you, a consumer uh, can get that directly, and I think um, I think this, this is part of what will happen. Uh, over the, hopefully over the next couple of years as, we, as each role and respective responsibility of the players in this complex system um, become more, more apparent. But it is, it is a, uh, a very difficult system for many people to, to navigate, particularly even in choosing their insurance plan. You know, when I was young and you know, very healthy uh, working for the federal government, I just wanted to know what was the cheapest health plan. And so sometimes the cheapest, you know, the lowest price premium is not the best plan if you, if you know what your, your health needs are. And so if you choose a plan that has a, a high prescription deductible, then you're going to pay during the course of the year. One of the, uh, the anomalies that we don't quite understand is why is it, even though the, the, the rebate is going to the insurance company, people are paying list price, even though insured people are paying list price until they ex exhaust the deductible. And that seems to be um, you know, a, a, a cause of great concern. I, I experienced that myself the my, my first time I filled my medicines. And the people, guy next to me saying, I paid $80 for these in November. It's the end of January, and now you, you know, it's $300. What's going on? Well, what's going on is you're paying list price uh, for a product that, uh, you know, that you have a deductible for. Why isn't there just the price? Oh, it's, it's, it's a great question because I, I, think, I think the answer is, and it's, it's interesting because one of the things that we hear, you know, the government should negotiate prices and the government should negotiate prices. We have a portfolio of products. We engage with pharmacy benefit manage, managers. They, their job is to try to get the lowest price um, for their, uh, the, the, their, the, the members of the public that they insure. And so what we do is we offer a set of discounts. So if I have a, a diabetes product and uh, Momenta has a diabetes product, they're going to say, hey, I will, you know, how much discount will you give me? And then the question is, I think, um, how much of that is passed on to the, to the patient? But I think it's, we, they try to set up competitive bidding, and the, the list price is just where the bidding starts. In the same way, if you look at the hotel, your hotel, the back of the door of the hotel has a price, but if you go onto a, a website with hotel rooms, you'll see a competitive bidding uh, you know, based, you know, uh, that far, far lower than the, than, the, than the list price. So it's, just, it's sort of a going in position. Anyone else over here? Good morning. Um, my name is Adam Ola. I'm uh, with the National Community Pharmacists Association. Uh, the question I wanted to ask is, I think we need to think about our motivations here. Um, who really gets hurt at the end of the day? It's are the patients. Uh, and talking about PBMs and things like that, just can anybody elaborate on the role that they think PBMs should play? And are we going to push the transparency um, for them to, to just, I mean, what needs to be done for that to happen, you know? Um, or are we just going to keep talking about it? And at the end of the day, like I said, the patients keep are the ones suffering. Think about the EpiPen and things like that. Um, you can't blame Mylan for raising the price because they're trying to make a profit on their product, just like, um, just like it was said earlier. So can anybody just elaborate on that? Um, where everybody has, there's a balanced role that everyone plays so the patient can get the, the care that they need, which is what we're all here for. So. Um, let us make one comment. I, 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 with respect to the, you know, the PBMs, I think that their role is becoming, uh, you, you know, I think, I think more uh, under a public discussion, which is probably a good thing. But they do play a vital role in the system because it would be hard for us to negotiate with every individual pharmacy, uh, every, every, every com community pharmacy in, in, in the country. The, I think the question is, um, you know how much does you know, what's the fair value of their service? What's the fair you know what's the, you know how, how do you uh, make sure it's appropriately um, uh, taken into account of? Because one of the things that we've done lately as a company in terms of transparency, we've for this uh, in our last quarterly statement, we've made it we, we we publicly declare what our net price increase is, which is a lot lower than these double digit list price increases that is fueling a lot of the public debate. I think we're at about two point three 
percent is what we're actually realizing after these debates, these rebates and discounts. And I think, uh, as a matter of fact, I think if you just do, search some of the literature, I think what we're actually um, realizing as a company and other companies is, is a lot um, less dramatic than some of the headlines uh, uh, suggest on the list price increase. And I think it's a, it's a fair question. Where is that other, where, where are those monies flowing to, I think is, is, a, is a question. I think that's one of the things that the HELP Committee is going to look at next week. Did you have a question, Maria? Hi, I'm Shannon. I'm with MedPage today. Uh, I had a question about the efficacy aspects. I've spoken with some oncologists who are concerned about the accelerated approval, not so much because of safety issues, but because they're concerned that um, the analytical evaluation that happens in that process de-emphasizes um, the clinical side of the approval pathway, and they may be less apt to switch to a biosimilar from a biologic. Can you talk a little bit about efficacy and switching and how you'll, how um, manufacturers can assure physicians that, that these drugs will be as effective as the biologic? Thank you. So, um, fair question. I think, um, you know, at Momenta, we believe in the, the value of analytics and, and, and balancing that with the clinical burden. Um, our position is that you can use analytics to show that something is um, the same, essentially. Um, that you can characterize the wazoo out of the molecule and, and the mixture that the molecule is in. And I think if you can get to that place, um, you could then view a vial similar as, as essentially akin to a small molecule, right? If the thing is the same, why would you expect any difference relative to the brand? Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that um, you know, clinical data won't be important, but I think that it can be balanced with, um, you know, analytics. Do you think there'll be, will, will you be pursuing interchangeable designations or um, simply biosimilars with your own additional backup data? To be determined. Um, well, we have a little bit of time left, and I wanted to just do a quick lightning round. Um, I wanted to know kind of what is number one on everyone's wish list for these patent issues related to biosimilars. What's the number one thing that could happen that you feel like would really clarify the issue, potentially in your favor? Um, and Courtney, maybe we can start with you, and you can speak for your clients since you don't really have a stake in this. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I think I think the most likely outcome from the Supreme Court is to leave leave the patent dance procedures optional. Um, and we are seeing biosimilars opting into them and not opting into them on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think, um, you know, as, as much as the originators expected them to be mandatory, I, I think the court at least will, would leave it like that. And perhaps if that's not satisfactory, um, you know, let, let them go back to Congress. I think on the second issue, it's much trickier. I think there's a lot of um, sort of public interest in believing that the product should be able to be marketed as soon as it's approved. Um, so I think that's a, that's a trickier issue um, on, on how they'll decide, because the statute is pretty black and white. Um, but the expectation, again, was, was different. I'll just quickly um, take the other side on the, if, if, this, if the court reaches the first question on the merits, I think that since the federal circuit seems to be overturned by the Supreme Court with some regularity, I, I think that the Supreme Court will conclude, I think rightly, that Chow mead Chow. I also think it's possible they may dismiss this case as improvidently granted, given some of the complexities and the, the, the real the angst that was expressed by some of the justices. But for us, I think the most important issue we face, believe it or not, in biosimilars and all of our patent litigation, I think our number one concern right now is the patent challenge system under the new patent bill in the AIA called Inter Partes Review, IPR, where um, you can, uh, the, the standard of evidence at the uh, per, in administrative proceeding at the PTO is lower, the preponderance of evidence, than it's been used in the federal courts, um, which is clear and convincing evidence. So I think to us, our number one uh, concern is the difference of the, uh, of the way the reviews are, are take, take place at the PTO versus uh, in, the, in, the, in the federal courts. And we obviously, we prefer the time-honored system of the federal courts. We have a case right now where we've won in the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, and now it's, it's under review at uh, the PTO with this lesser standard. Responding to that, I actually think IPRs are a good thing for the biosimilar <laughs> business. Um, you know, I think is what's good for the goose here. Um, so 
I think we all agree that, but why you know. Should, why should it be a lower standard at the, at the, than the federal courts? Why, why would that be? Why, why, why would we not um, have, give deference to, after, you know, we, we just talked about the $2.6 billion that we invest, and it's not at the time, mostly at the invention, it's the preclinical and clinical trials. We've relied on the patent. We've succeeded. We're one of the, you know, the, one of the eight drugs that meet clinical trial that gets approved, one of the two in 10 that gets approved that actually makes its money back, and then somebody comes in, and after all this reliance, they say, ah, let's, let's redo this case with preponderance of evidence. So let's flip the coin, or let's put, you know, the scale with one feather on one side. You know, it, you know, why should that be the rule? You know, that, that seems unfair to us. Why should the rule be different for biologics than it should be any other patent holder? Well, no, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be for biologics. We, we think for drugs and biologic, the rule should be clear and convincing evidence. It's, it's clear. That's what, that's what it is for every other patent in, in, the, in the federal courts. But every other patent is also subject to IPR. Why should we exclude? I think what you're suggesting is that we should not use IPR as for biologic. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I think the IPR rules itself, the standard of evidence, ought, ought, ought to be reviewed. Um, so <laughs> I think. As a matter of fact, we, we, we've been both um, on both sides of IPRs. I mean, we, you know, I think that you know, we, we've used the system, we've been, we've been uh, tested under the system. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the delta and the standard of views, we're splitting hairs there, right? Um, I, I guess what I'm, where I am is, um, you know, I think the, 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 the dawn of biosimilars is a good thing, right? We all agree that they will result in, um, in increased patient access to these important medicines. I think we're witnessing the birth of a new business here, and with that, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, you look at Hatch Waxman, it kind of followed the same path. I think what would be good for, for, for everybody here would be increased certainty. The Supreme Court can certainly weigh into that by, by pining on, on these two questions on the table and I think with that increased certainty we will get to you know um, a more streamlined way to have these biosimilars hit the market. Absolutely well thank you so much Courtney Brinkerhoff, Phil Nixon and Bruce Artem, uh, Artem yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> thanks so much guys.